Hey everyone, so it's Hearth and welcome back to my channel. On today's video, we are doing another Herbal Histories episode. I know it has been a really long time, but today we're going to be talking about the magical and mystical properties of mugwort. <laughs> Of all the plants in the world, mugwort is one of the most magical, or at the very least, it's associated with the magical more than many others. Alongside the mandrake, it has its part in folklore and legend, history and stories surrounding witches and psychic abilities. If you do want to check out my previous video on the mandrake, I will leave it linked in the top corner. Mugwort is deeply associated with dream magic, of astral projection, of psychic abilities and psychic development, as well as magical and spiritual properties as well. It is a plant that is deeply rooted in folklore and has a long history of being used for its magical properties. So today we're going to be talking about just that. The legends of this plant reach far and wide. It is natively found in Europe and Asia, but has been used by the Romans all the way up to modern day witches, Wiccans and other magical practitioners. It is also a very sacred plant among other traditions as well, being known as the sacred plant of St. John the Baptist, making it really commonly used in other traditions as well. Let's cover some of its correspondences first, as this might be useful for anyone who wants to incorporate it into their magical practice. Firstly, it is associated with the planets of Venus and the Moon. This is deeply linked with the folklore that we will be talking about in just a moment. It's also associated with the element of Earth. Because of this, it's also connected to the astrological sign Taurus, as well as to Libra, and it's associated with the goddesses Hecate and Artemis. As we can see with its connection, to two Greek deities, it's also a very feminine-based plant, or at least that's how people perceive it. I think it's really important to remember, though, that plants having masculine and feminine doesn't have any kind of association as to who can use it or how you must identify. It is simply the way the plants have been used throughout history. This is something that you don't have to incorporate into your magical practice if you don't want to or don't feel comfortable doing so. The history of mugwort has mainly been documented by the Romans. Now that's not to say that other people weren't using mugwort in a magical sense, more that the Romans had such an impact on history, especially as they traversed across Europe and made their way to the British Isles, that we see their stories and their traditions being documented more than many others during this time period. The first use of mugwort that we see throughout history is by Roman soldiers, who used to keep the plant in the soles of their shoes as a way of imbuing themselves with additional energy to stop them from becoming weary as they travelled and marched. Now this is something that we can incorporate into other forms of magical practice as well. The use of shoes as a way of manifesting goals is something that we see in many different traditions around the world, and it believes, much like hands, that different feet will have different associations, and by the act of walking on something that we've added into our shoes, we are adding energy into it and manifesting our goals. Many people will use knot magic on their shoes, in their laces as they tie them up to imbue them with magic. Other people will add symbols for protection and abundance into their shoes, so that as they are walking they are bringing protection with them, and they are also walking abundance into their life. If you wanted to remove something from your home, you could add a petition for it into your shoe, walk it away from your home, and then remove it from your shoe to dispose of it safely, essentially stepping it away from your life. Shoes and adding things into them has been used across traditions for a very, very long time, and mugwort is very deeply rooted in this tradition. I will say though, please don't just be putting any old thing in your shoe, you do not want to be hurting yourself, and you also don't want to be causing yourself accidental harm as well. A lot of plants will have skin reactions, and may also be toxic if handled, and so it's always important to be careful with what you are working with. Dropping back into the history for a little while, we can see that mugwort has a long record of being associated with protection. And it's not just protection from spiritual things either. Although it was associated with protecting against evil spirits, spirits and the evil eye, it's also been associated with physical protection such as protection from wild animals, which although today in our towns and cities might not be something that we need, it is something that historically was very, very important. And we can see this going back to the moving of Roman troops, for instance, especially if you were working through lands that had wolves and other wild animals, it was important that they felt and had protection, not only spiritually, but also physically as well. Perhaps less interesting than wolves, but mugwort was also used in medieval Europe to repel against pests and flies. And so we do see it being used in the home alongside other tools that we see now as being intrinsically magical, such as the cauldron and the broomstick, which were considered by the people of the time just everyday items. 
until we see them become wrapped up in the witch trial period, and then they suddenly become something a little bit more mystical and magical. Now going back into the history a little bit, we do see that a lot of the legends behind Mugwort are actually associated with St John the Baptist, who is believed to have worn a girdle of Mugwort as he entered the wilderness. And this ties back in once again to those protective properties and also the sacred element of this plant. And even today it still carries these properties, with people on St John's Eve wearing Mugwort crowns to protect them from possession by evil spirits. I had to say the word possession so many times because if it follows from, I put an R in it. So from possession, it's like, that's not right. From possession, possession. I have to learn to enunciate my words. <laughs> now earlier I briefly mentioned the associations to goddesses, specifically to Artemis and Hecate, but the mugwort plant is also associated with crone energy generally. When it comes to its connection to Artemis though, we can see this deeply rooted throughout the lore and history of this plant. Not only is it associated to the lunar realms of magic such as dream work and divination, psychic abilities and all things that are unseen, it's also found in the Latin name for common mugwort, being Artemisia vulgaris. So we really can see this link threading throughout. Generally though, mugwort is associated with the crone energy. We're talking about the wizened grandmother who's able to give you knowledge and wisdom and might tell you things that you don't necessarily want to know. When working with mugwort, both historically and today, it was commonly used to procure visions or fortune telling, to develop psychic abilities and to see what was unseen. And in the idea of seeing what cannot be seen, often there is a reason why that might not want to be seen. And so sometimes this plant is associated with the energy of knowing even what might be difficult to know. And that applies even today. If you plan on working with mugwort for divination purposes, be prepared that it might might not always be what you're looking for. It might not be the answer that you want to get, but it might be the answer that you need to know. And so it's very deeply rooted to this very elderly, wizened grandmother kind of energy, this crone energy that is doing what you need, even if it might not be what you necessarily want in the short term. Some slightly more trivial history here, but in Britain and Europe, before the discovery and the growth of hops, which are commonly used now in beer making, they used to use mugwort in order to preserve and add a bitter taste to their beer. Now this is something that was done for a very, very long time and it might be where the origin of some of the name comes from. The mug from mugwort would mean a mug plant and it's believed that this might be associated with its use in the beer making industry, essentially making it safe to be able to drink, which I think is just really, really cool. The idea that we have been developing things to make drinks better for as long as time immemorial I think is really cool. Today we associate hops very closely with beer making, that is a video all in itself. But to think that historically people were drinking mugwort a lot of the time, I'm wondering what they might have experienced as an outcome of that. Did they have more psychic abilities, more psychic dreams? Did they have premonitions in their waking life? Was their day-to-day -day life maybe a little bit more associated with that than we see today because of what they were drinking on a regular basis, which we simply don't drink commonly today? That is a point for an entirely different video, but I do think it's really interesting to consider the topic. It's not just the Romans that document the use of this plant or Roman associations with it. It's also seen in the 10th century charm called the Nine Wart Spell or the Nine Herb Charm and it's quite an extensive charm that was used to describe the properties of, you guessed it, nine herbs. Now I'm going to read the charm out to you. Be prepared, it is a little bit long. If you don't want to listen to it, I will put a timestamp on the screen if you do want to skip it. Now this version is translated from the Old English, so this is not exactly what it would have been like, but it is about as close as you could get in in the modern day, unless, you know, you knew Old English really well, which I don't. <laughs> Remember, mugwort what you made known, what you arranged at the great proclamation. You are called Una, the oldest of herbs. You have power against three and against thirty. You have power against poison and against infection. You have power against the loathsome foe roving through the land. And you, plantain, mother of herbs, open from the east, mighty inside. Over you chariots creaked, over you queens rode, over you brides cried out, over you bulls snorted. 
You withstood all of them, you dashed against them. May you likewise withstand poison and infection, and the loathsome foe roving through the land. Stoon is the name of this herb, it grew on a stone. It stands up against poison, it dashes against poison. Nettle, it is called. It attacks against poison, it drives out the hostile one, it casts out poison. This is the herb that fought against the serpent. It has power against poison, it has power against infection. It has power against the loathsome foe, roving through the land. Put to flight now, venom loather, the greater poisons, though you are lesser, until he is cured of both. Remember, chamomile, what you made known, what you accomplished, Allaford, that never a man should lose his life from infection, after chamomile was prepared for his food. Wurgaloo. 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 Wurgaloo? W-E-R-G-U-L-U. I'm reading this for the first time, folks. I'm not sure what that says. I'm pretty certain it's Wurgaloo, but that sounds kind of made up. Words are all made up anyway. Why does it matter? Okay. <laughs> this is the herb that is called Wurgaloo. A seal sent it across the sea right. A vexation to poison, a help to others. It stands against pain, it dashes against poison. A worm came crawling, it killed nothing. For Woden took nine glory twigs. He smote the adder that it flew apart into nine parts. There the apple accomplished it against poison, that she would never dwell in the house. Chervil and fennel, two of much might, they were created by the wise lord, holy in heaven as he hung. He set and sent them to the seven worlds, to the wretched and the fortunate, as a help to all. It stands against pain, it fights against poison, it avails against three and against thirty, against foe's hand and against noble scheming, against enchantment of vile creatures. Now their nine herbs have power against nine evil spirits, against nine poisons and against nine infections, against the red poison, against the foul poison, against the white poison, against the pale blue poison, against the yellow poison, against the green poison, against the black poison, against the blue poison, against the brown poison, against the crimson poison, against worm blister, against water blister, against thorn blister, against thistle blister, against ice blister, against poison blister. If any poison comes flying from the east, or any from the north, or any from the south, or any from the west among the people, Christ stood over diseases of every kind. I alone know a running stream, and the nine adders beware of it. May all the weeds spring up from their roots, the seas slip apart, all salt water, when I blow this poison from you. Mugwort, plantain open form the east, lamb's crest, venom loather, chamomile, nettle, crab apple, chervil and fennel, old soap, pound the herbs to a powder, mix them with the soap and the juice of the apple, then prepare a paste of water and of ashes, take the fennel, boil it with the paste and wash it with a beaten egg, when you apply the salve both before and after. Sing this charm three times on each herb before you prepare them, and likewise on the apple, and sing the same charm over the mouth of the man and into both ears, and on the wound before you apply the salve. Now, of course, I would not recommend that you mix up something like this today, but that is the contents of this particular nine wart spell. And it's something that we see a lot of the plants that are used in folk magic in the British Isles today, including chamomile and nettle. We see this repeated in this charm. And I think that is really interesting to point out that it is documented really heavily here. It takes first place essentially in this entire charm. So I just love things like this, like little bits and pieces of history that we can draw on. I think it's just really fascinating. In more modern history, mugwort has been used by some of the most famous magical practitioners that have written many, many books, including that of Scott Cunningham. Now, in one of his works, it is documented that he described mugwort as so, quote, The infusion is also used to wash crystal balls and magic mirrors, 
and mugwort leaves are placed around the base of the ball or beneath it to aid in psychic workings. And here we can really see the modern application starting to come through in the literature. We're not just seeing folklore, we're also seeing how actual practitioners are utilising it and its use in scrying and divination, fortune telling are all really, really significant today. And it's mostly what people will use mugwort for now. It's less associated with that protection aspect, although it still can be used as such. It is now commonly used for this fortune telling psychic ability aspect of its associations. And that leads us into its current magical usage. When it comes to modern applications, the first thing we need to talk about is psychic abilities and divination. For a lot of people, when they think of mugwort, this is where their mind first goes to. And it's probably the most common way of using mugwort in a modern setting. There are many different ways that we can use mugwort for this purpose, but let's go category by category. So let's start with trance and meditative states. These are two things that are really, really desirable. There are many different things out there to aid entering into these states, and when we're there, it allows us to have deeper communication with spirits, whether they be familiars, servitors, deities, angels, demons, whatever it is that you are working with, as well as with deities. When it comes to entering into a meditative state, it allows us to better contemplate the things that we need to be working on, and also to tap into our psychic mind, to bring the psychic forwards, and in some cases overlaying it onto the conscious mind, so that we can perceive things Things in a different way than we would consciously. These states can be entered into in many different ways. People will use drumming, people will use biurnal beats, or they will use trance meditations. There are many different ways of achieving this. Not everyone is going to need or want to use mugwort in order to achieve this, but it is something that can be done. Primarily, it is done through either tea or or through incense. Now I think it's really important to add here that just because something is natural doesn't mean it's safe for everyone. Mugwort is a plant that can interact with medical conditions as well as with medication and it isn't always suitable for everyone, including those who are pregnant, breastfeeding or attempting to get pregnant. Mugwort is also in the same family as wormwood, and it can have many of the same associations and the same side effects, and so it isn't something that should be taken super regularly, we're not talking about drinking it every single time you have a cup of tea, we're talking about taking it very occasionally, and if in doubt, check with your doctor or medical professional to make sure that you're going to be fine with it, and get something professionally blended so that you know exactly the proportion and what is suitable to take or to burn. But with the disclaimers out of the way, it can be used in these settings, either drank before you plan to enter into a meditative or trance state, or burned during the process to aid in dropping us down into these states. We're then talking about divination. So this is separate from scrying, scrying is coming next, just divination. We can use mugwort on our altar space to allow that space to be imbued with that energy to aid with our divination. We can also use it inside bags that hold tarot cards, oracle cards, we can use it within runes or oem as a way of imbuing them with that additional energy if that's something that you feel comfortable with. You can get sprays that have mugwort in it, mugwort essential oil in it, that allow you to imbue that space before readings if that's something you would prefer, or you can burn incense and drink the tea. Now the one other way of using mugwort in this scenario is something that does cross over into the scrying realm, and that is the use of washing down our scrying or divination items with an infusion of mugwort. Now to create this, there's lots of ways of doing it. You can cold infuse, you can hot infuse. Personally, I would have a bowl or a jug of hot water and I would be adding some mugwort in there to really steep in that water. You can crush the mugwort a little bit before you add it in to allow it to do it, allow it to sit for 10-15 minutes, take the mugwort out, and then you have a water or a wash that you can then wipe surfaces down with. I wouldn't necessarily recommend dousing surfaces in the liquid, but taking a cloth, making it a little bit damp, and then wiping down surfaces can be a great way of utilising this. You can do this on spaces that are going to be used for magical work, that are going to be connected to spirits, to deities, to servitors, to familiars. You can wipe down your crystal balls and your scrying mirrors, even your runes and dousing pendulums if this is something you want to do. And these can be really of any kind. They can be glass scrying mirrors and glass crystal balls. They can be obsidian crystal balls and scrying mirrors. A really easy way of making a scrying mirror is to take a glass picture frame, like really any of the ones I have behind me. You take out the glass, you paint the back of it black, and then you set that glass back in the frame again and you have yourself a scrying mirror. For even more 
potency. You can wash down the mirror beforehand with some mugwort infusion, and you can also place some dried mugwort behind the glass against the back of the picture frame as a way of imbuing it with even more potent energy. Change this out every three months or so, and you have yourself a really powerful magical tool. This is one way that we can use mugwort, and as Scott Cunningham also said, he adds mugwort leaves underneath a crystal ball as a way of imbuing that energy even further. It gives you something to be looking through the crystal ball at, and it allows us to essentially unfocus from the world around us, as well as imbuing additional energy into that space. Now, of course, we have the idea of dream magic and dream divination, but I've categorized that in its own section. Dream magic is a really interesting topic in and of itself. It involves psychic premonitions during dreams, lucid dreaming. It also involves magic that is cast in a dream state. And especially if you have control over your dreams and you can lucid dream, you are able to essentially shape the dream world around you and are able to perform magic in dreams if that's something you feel inclined to do. Specifically though, when it comes to psychic and premonition dreams, people often enjoy using mugwort for this purpose. Now, as with the previous category, you can drink mugwort tea, you can have mugwort incense burning in that space, but of course this isn't going to be suitable for everyone. So one thing that you can do is to create a mugwort pillow. Now, typically these pillows are mixed with other items as well. So in them, you can also include hops. Now we did talk about hops earlier as being the replacement for mugwort in the beer making process. Hops are very, very powerful at allowing us to sleep. And actually this has been found by many people on the job. Hops are very tall climbers. They're a climbing plant and people would often fall asleep whilst picking them because the fumes and the properties of the plant are so potent that they make you sleepy and people would often fall asleep on the job. It's one of the reasons why for some people beer makes them so tired. These included in with mugwort can help offer us deeper sleep that then also has psychic meaning as well. This isn't the only plant that you can use though. You can also use lavender, although many people are allergic to it. This can help with calmness and relaxation if you are struggling to enter into that peaceful state. You can also include in chamomile, one of my favorite plants ever, possibly my favorite. The beautiful scent of chamomile often helps with relaxing and unwinding. It's used to de-stress. And so it's also really useful in this kind of pillow. Now I have made my own pillow for this specific purpose. I've just taken two pieces of fabric. As I'm filming this, I'm not entirely sure what I'm going to be using, but you can use any number of different materials. You can use felt from the craft store. You you can use those little fabric squares that you can get as well. Often they're given as samples for fabric, but you can also get them as fabric squares for things like quilting and blanket making. So they're really easily accessible from craft stores. You can also make it from leftover material, old clothing that you're just gonna throw away that's full of holes. You know, you can really mix and match and use what is appropriate for you and what you have access to. You can use a sewing machine or you can sew by hand. It really depends on what you have access to and also what you are able to do. If you are unable to do the fine work of sewing something by hand, you are okay to hot glue it if that's the only option that you've got. So you can use fabric fusing tape where you put the tape on, you close the fabric up and then you iron it. That's an option. You can use hot glue if you need to. Really anything that's gonna make it stick for me, I am going to hand sew it because that's what I enjoy doing the most and I am able to do it. If you aren't, choose another option that is suitable for you. Essentially, you're going to want to create a pouch that you can then fill with the herbs of your choice. So you're gonna to wanna to leave one side of it open. You can make it as big or as small as you like. I would go for something kind of palm sized. You don't want it to be so small that you can't smell it or use it, but you don't want it to be so big that you're using so many herbs and items that it's overpowering. So something about the size of your palm or the size of your hand is appropriate for this. Now you can, if you want to, sew or draw on some sigils, symbols, magical wording, so that you can really imbue the bag itself with magical properties as well. It depends on how magical you want to make it. Do you want to stick with the mundane kind of properties of it, the fragrance, or do you want to also imbue your own magic in there as well? So you can add sigils, you can add a phrase that has been altered or changed, if that's something that you want. You can write it in Theban, or you can write it in Runic if you want to do that. There's so many different options here. Choose a thread or a colored pen that resonates with your intention and mark it on that bag before you start filling it. 
you're then going to want to take the herbs that you're going to use. I'm going to be using a blend of these herbs, so I'm definitely going to be using mugwort, obviously, because it is a mugwort video, but I'm also going to be using chamomile, my favourite plant, a little bit of lavender because I do find the fragrance a tad overwhelming, and I'm skipping the hops on this one, mostly because I hate the smell of hops. I've been haunted by the smell of hops for too long. I have a ginormous jar of them in my office, and every time you open it, it is the most overpowering smell I can't handle. I can't. I just can't. There's also going to be herbs out there that you really hate the smell of. If you hate a plant and you don't like working with it, do let me know in the comment section what it is. I love working with hops. I hate the smell of them, and so I just will not put them in anything that involves me smelling it. So once I'm done with this mixture and I've got the right blend that I'm after, I'm then going to imbue these with my energy. When they are charged, I will then add them into that bag and seal that bag up, charging the bag again before it is then going to be used. Now this can be placed underneath your pillow, or if you don't feel comfortable with that, it can go under the bed. It can go between the mattress and the bed frame, if that's what you feel more comfortable with. You can tie a ribbon loop onto one corner and hang it over the corner of a bed frame, if that's what you feel more comfortable with, or you can have it sitting on a bedside table. Essentially, you just need it to be in that space, in an area where you're going to be able to smell it preferably so that it can really imbue that energy and also the fragrance into your life. Now this is going to aid over time in dropping us into deeper sleeps that's more likely to manifest in psychic knowledge, whether that be coming from deities, spirits, familiar servitors through your dreamscape, or whether it's going to come from your own psychic abilities picking up on things as you sleep. Because when we are asleep, we are more open to the psychic world and the spiritual realm than we are normally, which is why a lot of people recommend having protections or extra protections on bedrooms just to stop anything untoward from influencing us during our sleep. Now, really closely associated with both divination and psychic abilities and dream magic is astral projection. And mugwort is really useful in astral projection, and it's used today in modern witch ointment salves or ointments, which are a replacement for the very, very, very toxic and dangerous witch and flying ointments that we use throughout history. If you are looking into this topic, please don't try to recreate the really old school witch or flying ointments because the difference between a dose that is going to offer that spirit flight and a dose that might is very, very minimal. And please, if you are untrained in it, don't go attempting to make them. But mugwort in an ointment form and in an infused oil form, not necessarily essential oil, please don't put this directly on your skin, can be used as an aid to spirit flight of hedge riding of astral projection, however it is that you want to refer to it as. Mugwort can also be kept in a bag or a pouch in a space that you are going to be performing your astral projection. Incense can also be burned for this purpose and tea can be drunk beforehand. So there's lots and lots of options here, but what I will say is please don't overdo it on the mugwort. These are all abilities that are going to come with time and practice. And while it can help to loosen up the spiritual or astral body, if you overdo it, you might end up with other issues in the long run. So if you're using an ointment and an oil and the incense and the tea all at once, that's going to be way too much. Pick one if you are going to choose any and just do a bit of trial and error. Don't use too much or too often, but it can be useful to kind of loosen up the astral spirit a little bit. And this ultimately comes down to the idea of practice and patience and time. These are all aids to astral projection, but they're not a guaranteed route to it. So just trying it a little bit every few days, it doesn't have to be for long, just to get yourself into a trance-like state, to loosen up the astral body a little bit is a great way of progressing onto further astral travel. There are also books on the subjects. There's one by Dennings and Phillips, which is all about astral projection. It's also spoken of briefly in Folk Witchcraft by Roger J. Horn, if that's something that you do want to look into a little bit more. Now, while its association with psychic abilities and astral projection might be primary, it also has abilities in cleansing and protection. 
So for cleansing, it's often used as a burning herb. This can be used in incense or alone as a way of cleansing a space. And not only does it remove and irritate stagnant energy to get it moving again so that you can then remove it from your space by opening windows and doors, but it can also be used to imbue psychic energies into that space in its place. So it allows to magnify the psychic work in that home to amplify the energy that you might want to work with spirits that you actually want to work with or to connect with psychic abilities. So you can get incenses that are specifically designed for this or you can blend your own, go from room to room, cleansing all of those spaces out, open as many doors and windows as you can to allow the smoke and the unwanted energies and spirits to leave. And then when you close it all back up again, you have a space that is not only cleansed of stagnant energy, but is also imbued with additional psychic energy as well. Now in personal cleansings, you can do this too. You can do it with smoke or you can put an infusion into a bath. So this could be in a similar way that you would infuse the water for washes. So you could put hot water in a bath and then add more gort in to kind of mix it up with other herbs. Or you can use specially created bath blends that are done by professionals in the craft. If you do want to add them in and you want to make sure that you're getting the right quantities, you can also use an infused oil in a bath or essential oil if you get the appropriate quantities. I think that's really, really important to say. Too many people use essential oils willy-nilly, or I'll just put as many drops in as I want, but they do have required quantities and too much can definitely be a harmful thing. So make sure that you do check the amount that you're putting in. Personally, I would typically stay clear of it. I would go more with an infused oil, like a botanical oil, and use that instead. You can also use sprays that have both cleansing properties and also mugwort in them as well. When it's coming to to cleansing magical tools, you can create a blend, either that be in a spray or in a wash that you can use on psychic tools that is both to cleanse unwanted energy away and also with mugwort in it to imbue it with a little bit of psychic something, something, you know, something extra in there. So it both cleanses away unwanted energies and imbues it with those properties on something that is new. So if you've just got a crystal ball from a shop, that is something that you can use it on. Please be careful with crystal balls, though I should have really mentioned this earlier. Some crystal balls that you can buy are glass that has been coated in a colour. And so if you do rub too heavily, you're going to wash that colour off. So just be careful in that regard. You don't really need to worry about it so much when it comes to quartz or obsidian. But if it is something like a, a painted crystal ball, which are quite popular now, I know I've sold them in the shop and still do, because they are a much more affordable option than some of the others on the market, it is something that you do need to be wary of. So in this instance, please be very, very careful. And lastly, we have protection. Now this one really ties in with the historic associations of mugwort with protecting from unwanted spirits, unwanted energies, to shield against fatigue and harm, to aid in travel. These are all things that can be utilized today. Mugwort can be placed alongside other plants for properties of protection in small glass bottles placed around the home to help absorb unwanted negative energies. Mugwort can be placed inside a locket with sigils and symbols of protection and worn for personal protection out and about as you're going around. It can be placed in bags or bottles that are then put in pockets and bags to make sure that you're staying safe as you go around. You can put it in your car in a little fabric pouch that allows you to stay protected as you travel and journey. Alongside other protective herbs, crystals and items, it can aid in protecting you psychically as well as spiritually and energetically, which I do find particularly significant, especially if you are a practitioner, maybe you're a psychic medium, maybe it's something you're just wearing of, this can be a great option for you to carry around. For remote protection of someone that you really care about, you can also put it into a poppet that represents them with additional protective or healing herbs and items, seal it up and then keep it in a really safe place. There are so many different options for protection, but those really are the simplest and easiest that you can work with. And for this, I wanted to create a pouch that you can carry around, you can have it by your bed for protection during astral travel, you can put it in a glove box of a car if you want protection during physical travel. You can put it in pockets and bags and things. Something really simple that we can carry around with us. Now for this, I'm going to be using some of my favourite herbs and plants to work with. You can mix and match, use some correspondences. There's a really good one that I have, which is called Scott Cunningham's Encyclopedia of Magical Herbs. This one's one of my favourites. And let me just get it up in the back here. You have entire lists of correspondences of different plants, two different associations. So it's got everything from image magic, um, love, what have we got? Divination of love, lust, manifestations, meditation, peace, harmony, prophetic dreams, 
prosperity, protection, and the protection section is really, really big. So something like this could be a good option. You can mix and match the things that you're gonna put in it based on your intention. So for me, this one is all about general protection, strength, and essentially being protected and steadfast in goals. So for me, I'm gonna be using a small bag. Now you can have a pre-made bag, you can make your own bag. I'm not sure what I'm gonna be using yet for this purpose. It depends on what I feel particularly drawn to use. And as with the pillow, you can put different protection symbols on it. You can use bind runes, you can create your own sigils, sigils that have already been created. You can put a pentacle on it, you can draw it, you can paint it, you can screen print it if you're really, really gifted. You can stitch it in, you can use like um, a plique. There's so many different Different options depending on what you feel particularly drawn and what you're able to do and use so be creative with it as much as you want. Inside I'm then going to be adding a mix of dried herbs. Now make sure that all of your plants are dried both for this and the dream pillow that we used earlier. What we don't want is for things to start rotting. Now for this I'm going to be adding a mix of different herbs. The first being mugwort of course. This is going to be for that psychic protection as well as psychic abilities. I'm then going to be adding in nettle. This stinging nettle is very good as a deterrent and a protective agent, so that is going in to deter against harm. I'm then going to be adding in some rowan berries. Rowan berries for me are one of my favourite plants to work with and they are deeply rooted in protection against earthbound spirits. And this can vary a lot. People will use them as protection from mischievous fae. They will also use them as protection from unwanted energies that are linked to the earthly plane. So these are spirits that are either, they could be disruptive nature spirits, they could be elementals, they could simply be human spirits that are wanting to play tricks and interact that are bound to the human plane for one reason or another. So I use them a lot for this particular purpose. And then I'm also going to be adding in some oak. Now oak for me is all about steadfast strength, longevity, protection, this kind of shelter from harm that I get a lot from the oak tree and I'm going to be adding that in as well. If you wanted to you can add a petition in there or a sigil that's going to state what it is that specifically you want to protect. You can also add in a crystal in there such as obsidian which is wonderful for this. You can also use clear quartz as a way of magnifying all of those energies. As you add them in, tell them what you want them to do, charge them with your energy, place them in the bag, seal the bag up, charge it with your energy again, and then carry it around with you. I would recommend recharging this every month or two just to make sure that it's nice and strong. You don't necessarily have to take all the items out again, just recharge the bag as a whole. For even extra potency, you can charge the bag by sweeping it through some mugwort smoke of mugwort incense that you are burning to really amplify that energy even further. And if you want to work with the moon energy, in association with mugwort you can do that as well so you can place that on a windowsill on the night of a full moon or the two nights either side of it are really good as well allow it to be infused with that lunar energy to really magnify the protective and psychic properties of mugwort so that's a really good and really easy way of doing it you can mix and match with the things that you've got access to and adapt it to suit you these are just the plants that I use the most these are the ones I have the deepest connection to and so they're the ones that I'm going to use more regularly and this then leads me into working with the spirit of mugwort. This is something that a lot of people bypass when it comes to plant magic, green witchcraft, anything of the kind, is that when we are able to connect with the spirit of that plant, we are able to have an even deeper connection with it. Not only are we working with the plant energetically, but also spiritually aiding us as an ally as well. And, and these plant allies can even go on to become familiars if we form a deep enough connection with them. Now this can be to an individual plant. So this would be a plant that you are growing yourself, that you have regular access to, that you can see and visit and spend time with and work with on a one-on-one -on -one basis or it can be to the collective energy of the plant spirit. So this being the energy of all mugworts, not just the one mugwort that you've got growing in your back garden, just as an example. So if you are working one-on-one -on -one with a plant, you can spend time with it, you can nurture it, take care of it, go outside, see it, interact with it. If that connection is developed even further, you can request that you take some leaves from that plant. You can then work with those more closely without having to go outside all of the time to really connect with them that way. If you don't have access to a mugwort plant, but would like 
to connect with the spirit of mugwort generally, look into further some folklore, legend, mystery surrounding the plant. You might find localised legend as well, depending on where you live. You can take some of the dried plant that you have purchased, sleep with it under your pillow, work with it in meditation to connect with the spirit of the plant that way. You can use this technique with both one-on-one -on -one plant spirits and also collective plant spirits. If you place that plant under your pillow, you'll often find that the energy and the information the plant wants to give you will come through to you in dreams, which is why I mention it so often having some kind of dream journal is a great way of going about it. Once you form that connection with that plant, you can then request its aid specifically as a spirit as well as energetically in spell work, ritual, divination, fortune telling, astral projection, etc, etc, to aid you on a personal one-on-one -on -one level, which can be a great way of working with it further. And you can then start using other things such as cards, images, pictures that represent that plant and then work with the spirit of that plant through them. So, and once you've formed a connection with the collective plant spirit, you can ask that they come through in that image so that you can then work with them in other ways. So you can incorporate them onto an altar space if you want to imbue that energy generally. You can include them into larger workings and rituals if you aren't able to access that plant directly or maybe you aren't able to handle it or breathe it in or drink it. You can work with the plant that way if that's something that you want to be drawn and connected to. There's so many different options here and it's really, really flexible once you start getting into like the nitty gritty of working with these plant spirits, you can achieve so, so much with them. And I didn't really know where to put this last little mention, but the stem of a mugwort can actually be used as a wand in dream and divination type magic, or really lunar magic in general. It is a very, very brittle tool to use though, so it's something you've got to be very, very careful with. But if you do want to work with that spirit even further and utilise it as an active tool, not just a herb that you are using in spell work and ritual, that is something that can be done. Though they're quite hard to access, you're going to have to find one yourself typically and they break very, very easily. So just be cautious. It might be a one and done type of tool where you use it for a specific working and then you return it back to the earth again. Just before I go, I want to reiterate a few of the dangers of working with mugwort because it is really important to remember that just because something is natural doesn't mean it is safe. Mugwort, much like wormwood, contains thurjoin or thujoin, I'm not sure how to say it, T-H-U-G-U-N-E. This is the same active ingredient that is in wormwood and it's what can make wormwood so dangerous. The effects of it vary person to person, with some people have a really strong reaction and other people not feeling much at all and it's very, very individual. So make sure that if you are in contact with it a lot of the time, such as I am, I will wear gloves because it can, just in contact with the skin, penetrate into your bloodstream. So just make sure that you are being safe, you're not using large volumes of it, you are checking with your doctor and you are always being cautious. Just because something is used magically for hundreds of years doesn't mean it is safe to be using in large quantities today. So it is very useful and it's a very powerful plant and the spirit of it is very beautiful and strong and can give us a lot of information and knowledge. That information does come with the requirement to be careful. Just like in last episode when it came to mandrake, a lot of the witchiest plants out there are also some that have the not so nice side effects as well. So with all of that being said, that is the herbal history of mugwort. These are so time consuming for me to script and film, which is why I've been putting it off for so long. But I really enjoyed learning a little bit more about this plant and there is so much more out there that you can find. Different regions and different locations will have slightly different folklore and history. I just didn't want this video to be any longer than it already ended up being. But let me know how you use mugwort. Do you enjoy using it in your magical practice? What are your favorite ways of using it? I would love to know. And are there any additional plants or herbs you would like to learn more about in one of these videos? Do let me know in the description box. If you've made it this far into the video, feel free to put some leaves or some trees in the comment section and I will try to heart as many of them as I can. Basically any natural emoji, whether it be plants, flowers, leaves, I will try to heart as many of them as I can. So with that being said, if you did enjoy this video, feel free to give it a like, it means a lot to me. If you do enjoy the magical content on this video or on this channel, feel free to hit subscribe. I try to post magical content every single week. And with that being said, I hope you're staying safe, I hope you have a marvellous magical day, and I will see you in the next video. Bye! I'm so shiny. Huh. I don't know what's happened there. I must have messed something up in the steps of my, my makeup. What is reflecting? If I turn this off, my computer screen.
not ideal because I need that on. I don't think there's any way of getting around that. Worse, does it? Now you can see both lights in it. Oh no. It's distracting me because I can I can see it all the time. I'm not wearing any earrings. That's what looks so weird. I'm not wearing any earrings. I'll go fix that, but first let's load this up. My OneDrive decides, you know what? Today is the day that we're not going to function. So it's not opening anything and it won't let me download anything and it won't let me see anything. Please, please, yes! <laughs> hey everyone, so it's Hearth and welcome back to my channel. I should probably turn my microphone to actually face me. That would be good, wouldn't it? Hey everyone, so it's Hearth and welcome back to my channel. I have not turned this on. I knew, I knew I was gonna forget something. Okay, I don't know how well that's gonna work. I have one new battery in it, one old battery in it because I only have one battery and I just have to hope for the best, okay. I'm going a little bit doo lally. Um. sitting here for too long. My butt's numb already. Okay, pre-warning. I split the side of my lip earlier. I yawned and I split my skin here. So if it looks really red, that's why. Mm -hmm. 